The IQ, or Intelligence Quotient Test, has been controversial since its introduction into mainstream society a century ago. Joining us now for more on its history and how the tests are used today in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Kathy Fiorello, professor and coordinator of the School Psychology Program at Temple University. And Kathy Fiorello, it's good of you to join us on TVO tonight. How's your Intelligence Quotient doing this Thank evening? Not too bad, Steve. Thank you. I bet it's just great. Can you, uh, let's start there actually, why don't you tell us about the different components that actually go into testing someone's intelligent quotient? Well, I think one of the uh, things that people run into is that they take some kind of IQ test online uh, and they think that that's, you know, probably a, a valid measure of their IQ. But really when you get your IQ tested by a psychologist for real one-on-one, -on -one, there are a lot more components to it than what you would see in an online test. Um, so very often we have you solving puzzles and, you know, telling stories and answering questions, defining words, possibly doing math problems, a real variety of things. And by the time you get to the end of it, you've got a good sense about how intelligent somebody is? We do, uh, and also have a sense of their strengths and weaknesses. Um, so we can take a look at, for instance, you know, some folks are stronger verbally, some people are good at novel problem solving. and. Some people are good at math, some people are good at spatial reasoning, uh, so we look at that as well. We mentioned off the top that its origins go back actually about a century. Can you tell us more about who created it and how? Yes, it was originally developed uh, in France to identify children that needed uh, special educational support, and that's still primarily really how we use it today. When Binet developed it in France, it was then brought to the U.S. Uh, by Terman, who brought it to Stanford University, and the Stanford Binet is still one of the major tests that we use today to assess children and adults um, to look at their intelligence and also to look at their different cognitive abilities. One of the other expressions I hear besides IQ testing is also cognitive assessment. Uh, is that essentially the same thing? We've been using cognitive assessment more recently uh, as a broader term. Um, IQ testing was originally used for the tests because we were primarily trying to derive one single IQ score to know how smart someone was. Um, and with the greater emphasis now in looking at people's different cognitive abilities, we tend to call it cognitive assessment. But the, the person on the street still pretty much thinks about IQ. And let me ask about that because uh, I think even Binet himself a century ago was saying, this thing does have its limitations. You can't, you know, it's not gospel. Is that still the case today? Absolutely. I mean, I think we've gotten better. Uh, we've made, you know, great strides in a hundred years. Um, but I think people kind of get the impression that it's kind of like we do an x-ray and we see how smart you are. And it's not like that. It's certainly filtered through the questions that we choose to ask and the norm group that we're comparing you to. So the way IQ tests or cognitive assessments work now um, is that we have a variety of these tasks. We give them to thousands of people and see how they perform and then you're being compared to that group. So we call that the norms group. Um, and what happens is you need to see how similar a person is to the norms group in order to decide whether you're getting meaningful information. Uh, and that's one of the things that 100 years or even 50 years ago we weren't very good at. Most of the tests were developed by and normed on sort of middle class white American people. Um, and then applied to a large variety of people from different backgrounds um, and even non-English speakers, which, as you can imagine, didn't yield terribly accurate results. Sure. So do, do I infer from that that the test today is quite dramatically different from the way Binet invented it 100 years ago? We've made great improvements, um, and a big part of that has been the understanding of how broad and representative the tasks need to be and how broad and representative the norms group needs to be now. Um, there's not the notion that everybody goes through the same developmental stages. Um, so we look at, you know, kind of a, a broader variety of tasks. Um, one of the things that happens with IQ testing is that if you give people a lot of different cognitively complex tasks, uh, people who do well tend to do well on all of them. T people who do badly tend to do badly on all of them. Hmm. Um, so that we can derive something like an IQ that's an overall score. But for example, one of the, one of the major ways that 
Binet measured intelligence uh, back in the day was with a vocabulary test. And we still do use that. But if you're dealing with folks who have different cultural background or different linguistic background, as you can imagine, the, how, the, how they define certain words isn't actually going to be a very good measure of intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we focus more now on cognitive processing, problem solving, memory, things like that, that minimize the content to a certain extent so that people from different backgrounds can be more fairly assessed. Well, of course, here's the big question, and that is after 100 years of doing these kinds of tests, admittedly with their evolution and changes, do you think intelligence is primarily innate or acquired? It's both. <laughs> That's something that we can never really separate out. Sorry. I know you're trying to pin me down, but it's, it's all, all cognitive abilities develop in a person developmentally in response to their environment and in interaction with their environment. Um, so you can't really separate that out. You could have you know, the child of Einstein and Marie Curie, and if you raised them in a dark closet, they would not be very intelligent. <laughs> Um, you, you need the environmental input as well as decent genetics in order to get anything. Um, we know that there is a biological and genetic component. Um, we see there are children, for example, with uh, genetic disorders that affect their intellectual functioning or their IQ, such as Down syndrome. Um, there are other genetic errors that can happen, like Fragile X, um, that will affect intellectual functioning. So we, we know there is a biological sort of component to it, but how much of that um, develops, how much intelligence you actually develop and can use depends on what you're exposed to in the world. So would it be a slam dunk that the child of Albert Einstein and Marie Curie, if given a you know terrific education and uh, mm -hmm. told to read uh, periodic journals uh, over breakfast, as no doubt those two parents would make their child do, is it a slam dunk that Indeed. that kid's going to be brilliant? Not necessarily, but the odds are in their favor. Gotcha. Um, e even, for one thing, I mean, even geniuses have kids with Down syndrome. Understood. Right? So there can be, there can be uh, you know, genetic issues. There could be even teratogenic issues if, uh, if a child's exposed to lead, for example. Hmm. Uh, it diminishes their cognitive capacity no matter what they might have been born with. But if you had both strong heredity and strong environment, you're probably in pretty good shape. Okay, let's go from history to today. What is the IQ test still used for today, primarily? The individual IQ test very largely, especially in the United States, but certainly Canada and most of the Western world, um, is used for identifying school difficulties, uh, just as Binet originally designed it for. Um, probably the two most widely used tests, still the Stanford Binet um, and the Wexler scales, um, are used every day in schools to identify why kids are having difficulty in school. Um, there are other tests you know, that are more, as I said, more modern, have uh, tried to look at different cognitive processes so that we can figure out a little more precisely why someone is having difficulty. Uh, but that's, that's still the, the primary use. Now, we still use them in industry and stuff, but I would say school is probably number one. That's what I was going to follow up on next. For example, uh, if you want to get into the police or you want to get into the military or, um, you know, let's say a, a specialized police force like the FBI, do, do they still use the IQ test? Yes. Um, IQ testing is definitely part of um, any, any kind of industrial organizational psychologist will tell you that when we're selecting folks for jobs, that IQ testing is still a part of that. One of the things that's interesting about it, though, is that for some jobs, what we're looking for is higher IQ. For some jobs, what we're looking for is a lower IQ. Um, there was a case not too long ago um, here in, Conne in Connecticut, in the US, um, where a man tried to get in the, on the police force, scored too high on the IQ test, was turned down for the job, uh, sued them, saying that it was discrimination against people who were bright, um, and he lost the case. Uh, because the thought was that if you were too bright, you wouldn't follow orders well, uh, and you would get bored with the job and leave, wasting their training time. Uh, what if, for example, and this is obviously an increasing, this, is, this has always been a feature of Canadian life where we're an officially bilingual country, but in the United States, of course, you're becoming increasingly bilingual with um, the um, 
-hmm. increasingly large Hispanic population. Do they change the yes. test if you're bilingual? They certainly should, absolutely. Um, and that's one of the places where we have seen a great deal of growth in the U.S. is development of tests and norming of tests in Spanish um, because of that growing population. Um, so we have more you know, parallel forms. You can't just translate a test, and I think that's um, something that's probably important for folks to know. It has to be actually revised sort of from scratch when you move into a different language uh, because the culture and the language are different. It's more than just different words for things. So even the kinds of questions that you might ask might be different. Um, so, you know, I don't know enough about Canadian culture to know how different it might be between the English speaking and the French speaking parts. Um, but I know that words that are common in English that might be used very easily in an IQ test in English might be considered very high level words in Spanish and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of need to start from scratch to make sure that the difficulty level is the same. Right. Let's go Some back of the to the school system. Puzzles and tasks might be. Sure. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the school system for a second because uh, I know one of the things that we've debated here in, in the province of Ontario for decades, in fact, and uh, it's just come back again, is this whole issue of streaming kids into, you know, academic, advanced, or lesser or more practical uh, trade oriented uh, streams in school. Um, what does your right. research say about the advisability of streaming kids early in high school? Well, it depends on how, um, how firm the boundaries are, I would say. Um, there's some evidence that grouping kids according to the level that they're working on can be helpful instructionally. Uh, but putting kids into a stream or a track early on that there's no way that they can escape um, can have really detrimental effects. So if you, if you offer a variety of things and it's fairly easy to move from one stream to another, it can be helpful. Uh, but if it's you kind of get locked in, I think we see that in a lot of uh, European type school districts. Um, where you kind of take a test at 13 and if you're on the vocational track that's your life and if you're on the university track that's your life and, and that can be very detrimental just because that one sort of high stakes test could lead to very different results just based on that one snapshot whereas if you look at kids development over time you have a much better idea of really what their intelligence is and what their abilities are. Sure there, there's also a, I know up here some discrimination that comes into it as well if for example uh, some, some student comes from the Portuguese community, for example. Uh, teachers mm -hmm. disproportionately stream them into the lower streams just because they assume that they come from less educated households. Uh, I, I, yes. Which is why I'm sort of curious about your, the first part of your last answer where you suggested that there actually can be some benefits to streaming. Like what? If, if children are appropriately placed, uh, that is to say it's not we put you in the lower stream because you are Portuguese or we put you in the lower track in America because you're black. Um, but if it's actually based on the, the, the level that you're functioning at right then um, in the given curriculum, it can be much easier for teachers to individualize teaching, for the kids to work together on things. One of the things that happens in mixed classes um, is that teacher kind of aims at the middle and the kids at the lower end don't get enough opportunities to practice and learn. And the kids at the upper end, I don't know what they do in Canada, but in the US, we give them extra work. <laughs> we make them tutor the other kids, or we give them a workbook or something. Um, and it's just not optimum. They could move ahead um, if they were grouped together. But it doesn't have to be based on IQ. It could be based on, now we're going to put all the kids that are good at math together for math. And you, that may be different kids than the kids that are good at reading. They're going to be together for reading. It's much more fluid. Sure. And when you do it that way, it can be really helpful. What about, uh, let me get your views on the different styles of learning. You know, some students are good, uh, better at auditory as opposed to visual or kinesthetic as opposed to one of the other two. Um, what do you say about that? Uh, sadly, what the research says is that it doesn't matter. There's no such huh. thing. Um, and I, I s probably spend more time trying to debunk learning styles than I do anything else. Um, I, I uh, work in a college of ed, and even my fellow faculty 
are really into the learning styles thing. Um, what the research shows is that the medium that you teach in should be dictated by the content that you're teaching hmm. um, and not by a student's preferred style. So there are certain things like geography that need to be visual. There are certain things like literature that need to be auditory and got to go with what makes sense for the content. Gotcha. Uh, we all know students, maybe you were one of them, I don't know, who uh, are really intelligent, but for some reason that just doesn't show up when it comes time to write the test. Is there any way mm -hmm. to kind of take that into account when we assess how intelligent somebody is? One of the things that happens when we do a real assessment, and by that I mean an individualized assessment, is that we look at a variety of information. Um, we're not making decisions based on one test or one score. Um, we're looking at a kid's history. We're gathering information from parents and teachers. We're doing observations in the classroom. So it's much more unlikely um, that we would then get into a room, give an IQ test, and say something completely anomalous to the rest of their history. And if we did see that, then we would be asking questions. Um, is, you know, can the kid hear? Can the kid speak? Can the kid see clearly? Um, you know, what was the language in the home? All of that information is beforehand so that we don't get into the situation of giving an IQ test and then getting a score that doesn't make any sense. Hmm. Set us straight as well on the conventional wisdom, which you hear all the time, which is people with a higher level of intelligence also experience higher levels of anxiety and frustration. Is that true? Uh, it seems to be, at least in some cases. Um, and we're not sure whether that's just because we have, um, that, that higher intelligence folks have more of a sense of what might be coming. Um, they may be thinking ahead more um, and have more notion that there are bad outcomes that could happen hmm. um, that might you know, make folks more anxious because it occurs to them, you know, where it might not occur to other folks to play it out and see where it might go and realize that there might be a bad outcomes. Um, but it's not necessarily true that people who are more intelligent are more rational. Hmm. So. I, I gather that, um, well, we're seeing increasing research these days that rather than a high IQ, it is actually better for you personally, professionally, and otherwise in life to have a higher EQ emotion quotient. And I wonder whether you agree it's better to have a higher EQ than IQ in order to achieve, you know, overall happiness and success and so on in life. Well, I got to tell you that I would vote for both, you know, <laughs> given the choice. We don't usually get the choice, though. Usually um, we got to choose, right? We, we usually do not get the choice. Um, what happens is that intelligence and emotional intelligence or, or those kind of soft skills are good for different things. And you can be really intelligent, but if you can't apply that in the real world in a way that is appropriate for the workplace or for the school, that you will be less successful. You know, so we can have people that were really bright and any of them could be a computer programmer and could learn to master the programming language and, and write you know, a cool app but the one who's the most emotionally in tune and emotionally intelligent and has the best social skills is going to be the one who's going to talk to the clients, find out what they really want, be able to tailor what they're doing to those desires, and be more successful for that reason. Hmm. But if they didn't have the intelligence to begin with, just having the emotional skills wouldn't be enough just by itself for that, for that particular job. So it depends on what the job is. You know, if you want to sing on The Voice, <laughs> right? IQ probably doesn't matter. Good EQ would be very helpful under those circumstances. Listen, EQ you know this would be very helpful. You know this question's coming. We got about 20 seconds left here. You've surely had your IQ tested. What is it? One of the things that we know about IQ is that there's no one number. There's <laughs> always a band of there's always a range. Uh, but I will say that right now since I train people to give IQ tests, I know all the answers. <laughs> so you're taking a test is not that useful or helpful anymore because the fix not is in. Not that helpful anymore. I, I know all the answers. Gotcha. So you're, you're no doubt wouldn't, over 200 or fair. something. Okay. Probably. Kathy Fiorello, it's awfully good of you to join us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thanks very much and stay intelligent. Thank you very much.
Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.